The Signal Oil Program, The Whistler. That whistle is your signal for the Signal Oil Program, The Whistler. Whistler, and I know many things, for I walk by night. I know many strange tales hidden in the hearts of men and women who have stepped into the shadows. Yes, I know the nameless terrors of which they dare not speak. Yes, friends, it's time for the Signal Oil program, The Whistler, rated tops in popularity for a longer period of time than any other West Coast program in radio history. And Signal Gasoline is tops, too, tops in quality. It takes extra quality, you know, to give you extra mileage. And Signal is the famous go-farther gasoline. So look for the Signal Circle sign in yellow and black that identifies independently operated Signal stations from Canada to Mexico. And now the Whistler's strange story. Impulse. The crowd in the waiting room of the New York airport hardly noticed the small, slender man in the trench coat standing near the magazine counter. The few who gave him a passing glance certainly had no way of guessing what was going through his mind at the moment, for his face betrayed no sign of the struggle that raged within him. Christopher Daniels, professor of English, was striving to reach a decision, a very important decision. At this moment, Christopher Daniels had reached the crossroad. He had a choice to make. He could go on living his own dull life. Or a new life, the life of another man, a man whose name was now being called over the Mr. public Neil address Baldwin, system. Mr. Baldwin, please report to the reservation desk immediately. Mr. Baldwin, please. Suddenly, Christopher Daniel shuddered. It had all happened so suddenly, it seemed like a bad dream. Yes, a bad dream that had started that afternoon in his room at the hotel. Perhaps it had really started this morning at his home in New Haven. That unpleasant scene with his wife, Blanche. He'd forgotten what had brought it all on. Money, his job. It didn't matter, really. The scenes with Blanche always ended the same way. Oh, Blanche, please. We've been all over this time and time again. Yes. Yes, we have, Chris. And what good has it done? You never think of me, really, oh. what I gave up to marry you. I know. I could have had a lot of things, Chris. But no, I had to fall in love with an unambitious English professor. Blanche. A professor who writes second-rate poetry on the side. That's enough. Is it? Every time I've suggested you give up this, this seamy job of yours... Blanche, leave me alone. Please, just leave me alone. <laughs> Yes, Chris, perhaps it was then the bad dream had started. That unpleasant scene with Blanche, like so many that had gone on before. Scenes that left you empty, miserable, sitting in your study oblivious to everything except the vague wish you usually had at times like this, that things would somehow straighten themselves out. You hadn't heard the doorbell. Then you saw Blanche and your old friend Neil Baldwin standing in front of you. Hello, Chris. Well, Neil... This is a surprise. How are you? Fine, fine. Well, it's good to see you again. Sit down. Thanks. Only for a minute, though. Well, let's see. It's been two years, hasn't it? Just about, I guess. Class reunion. Yeah. What in the world are you doing here in New Haven, Neil? Well, you sound as if this is the end of the world. It... Chris doesn't seem to think so. Oh, Blanche. As a matter of fact, we've practically been neighbors the last couple of years. I've been working back and forth between here and Boston for an investment house. Really? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, but that's all over now. I just stopped in to say goodbye. Goodbye? Well, here we haven't seen you in two years, and you're saying goodbye. Where are you going? New York right now, then to South America. South America? Oh, that's wonderful, Neil. A business trip? No, Chris. I guess my business days are over. 
Had a talk with my doctor last month. It's either take it easy or else. Oh. So I'm going to take what little money I've saved, go down to South America, where I don't know a soul, and loaf the rest of my life. Well, I'm sorry to hear about your health, Neil, but this trip sounds wonderful. When are you leaving? Plane leaves late this afternoon. This afternoon? Neil, how are you going to New York? Train. I'll drive you down. Well, that's nice of you, Chris, but I I, I couldn't think of it. No, no, really, I'd like to. But, Chris, you'd be awfully late getting back. Look, I no, can I take a stay overnight in New York, a hotel, and I come back tomorrow. Well, I... I don't know. If Blanche doesn't mind... Uh, Blanche, I, I just thought that... Well... Why, certainly, Chris. Go right ahead. A sudden impulse, wasn't it, Chris? Perhaps you hoped that would straighten things out between you and Blanche, just getting away from her overnight. Quickly, you run upstairs to throw a few things in your bag. And later, as you're driving Neil down the coast toward New York. Uh, cigarette, Chris? No, thanks. How have things been going for you, Chris? Oh, pretty well. Pretty well. Look, old man, I know it's none of my business, but uh, anything wrong between you and Blanche? Wrong? No. Not really, I guess. Not really. You can't very well tell Neil the truth, can you, Chris? Tell him that long ago you realized you didn't love Blanche anymore. That you haven't done anything about it because you're sure she needs you. Yes, despite her attitude, her obvious annoyance with you, you're certain she loves you, needs you. But you can't tell Neil you want to call it off. Because you hardly dare tell yourself. You were never one for facing anything like that, were you, Chris? You're the kind who always hopes things will straighten themselves out somehow. That it will all be arranged for you. Now you're running away overnight, hoping that will do the trick. And later, as you park your car in the garage, check in at the New York Hotel, you think of something else that might help. The eating place in Greenwich Village you used to like. But Neil doesn't seem interested. To tell you the truth, Chris, I'm worn out. Oh. Well, that wasn't important, really. Look, I'm not hungry anyway. Why don't you run along to your restaurant? I'll just stretch out here on your bed. Take a nap. Well, I could do that, I suppose. You wouldn't mind? Of course not. We have plenty of time. The plane doesn't leave for another three hours. I need the rest. Go on, run along, Chris. Oh, uh, you got a cigarette on you? Yeah, yeah. You better leave the pack. I'm all out. I have another pack around somewhere. It must be in my briefcase. I... Good Lord. My briefcase. What's the matter? My briefcase! My... <laughs> oh, I uh, thought for a moment I'd forgotten it. My ticket's papers are in it. I just remembered I left it in your car with my luggage. Oh. Uh, bring it up when you come back, will you, Chris? Yeah. Yeah, of course, Neil. You leave Neil stretched out comfortably on your bed, cigarette smoke curling from his nostrils. You go on to that quaint little restaurant in the village. But that doesn't seem to help. You sit there, hardly touching the food or the wine. Finally, you leave, drive back to the hotel, park your car, and start down the block with Neil's briefcase tucked under your arm. It isn't until you're almost to the hotel entrance that you notice the excited crowd milling about, the policemen keeping them back, and the white ambulance slipping away. What's the matter, officer? There's been a fire upstairs in the hotel. No one allowed on the seventh floor. Fire? Seventh floor? Yeah, a man burned to death up there. Must have been smoking in bed. All right now, folks. Come on, let's clear the entrance. Come smoking on, come in on. Bed. Keep moving. Burned now. to death? Officer, who was it? Huh? Who was it? The man who was... Oh, oh, a man named Daniels. Christopher Daniels. It's a horrible shock, isn't it, Chris? Your friend Neil Baldwin burned to death in your hotel room. And you stand in the street with Neil's briefcase under your arm, staring emptily at the window on the seventh floor. They all think you're dead, don't they, Chris? Yes, Christopher Daniels is dead. Somewhere you find your way back to your car. 
You remember opening the briefcase, looking at the papers. The ticket is for Bermuda instead of South America. Bermuda, flight 11. And there are Neil's papers, a reservation at the Crystal Beach Hotel. And there's something else, too, an envelope with money in it. A lot of money. Mr. Neil Baldwin, please report to the reservation desk immediately. Mr. Baldwin, please. The next thing you know, you're at the airport, standing in the waiting room by the magazine counter. You realize it isn't just a bad dream. It's real after all, isn't it, Chris? You realize, too, what brought you out here. The idea that's gnawed its way into your mind. No. No, I can't do it. I can't. leaving for Bermuda. All aboard, please. I must be out of my mind. I can't do a thing like this to Blanche. I can't. Mr. I won't. Mr. Baldwin, please report to the reservation desk immediately. Mr. Baldwin, please. <laughs> Please. Mrs. Farley Crane, New York. This is Flight 11, Bermuda, isn't it? That's right, Mrs. Crane. Step up, please. Your name, sir? Your name, sir? Baldwin. Neil Baldwin. With the prologue of Impulse, the Signal Oil Company brings you another strange story by The Whistler. This, you know, is the sixth consecutive year that Signal Oil Company has sponsored The Whistler. A long time for a radio program, yet short compared with the 18 years that Signal has served the West. However, just as The Whistler has grown to be the most popular West Coast radio show, Signal has grown too. Grown from a mere handful of stations serving Southern California to many hundreds of dealers serving six Western states from Canada to Mexico. Now, obviously, there must be good reasons why so many drivers have switched to signal gasoline. And there are. One important factor, of course, is good mileage that has made signal famous as the go-farther gasoline. But equally important is the thing which makes such mileage possible. I mean the extra efficiency today's signal gasoline coaxes from your motor, which naturally means extra performance for your car. That's why signal says, To be sure of the tops in gasoline quality, there are just two things to remember. One, it takes extra quality to go farther. And two, signal is the famous go-farther gasoline. Now back to the whistler. It's a long way from New Haven to Bermuda, isn't it, Chris? And it's too late to turn back. You finally made your decision. Or was the decision to assume Neil Baldwin's identity thrust upon you? Was this the way things were straightening themselves out like you'd hoped for? And right now you don't want to turn back. No, you've managed to put your wife Blanche out of your mind with the help of Dorothy Gilbert. Yes, it was on the plane trip to Bermuda that you met her. And the two of you hit it off right from the start. You sensed instinctively that the two of you had a lot in common. You felt a pleasant glow when she smiled. Finally, there's the arrival itself, the beautiful green island of Bermuda looming up in a turquoise sea. You check in at the Crystal Beach Hotel, register as Neil Baldwin. Later, in one of the quaint horse-drawn surreys, you ride over to Belmont Manor, where Dorothy is staying. You're excited, aren't you, Chris? Like a schoolboy on his first date. I didn't expect to see you so soon. I couldn't wait, Dorothy. You ready? Ready? Where are we going? Across the island. I'm going to show you something you'll never believe. Pink sand. Pink sand? Yeah. Oh, that sounds wonderful. It's got flecks of pink coral all through it. The whole beach just below my hotel is that way. Come on, you've got to see it. All right, I'd love to. Well, then come along. My, uh, my carriage awaits. Without. <laughs> well, looks like we're stalled. Yeah. What's the trouble, driver? It's Reginald, sir. Huh? Who's Reginald? The whole stuff. The whole stuff's here. <laughs> What's the matter with Reginald? No trouble, ma'am. He just likes to catch his breath. Oh. Yes, Dorothy? I'd like to stay on here a lot longer than my three weeks' vacation. 
I think I'd like to stay here for a long time, Neil. So would I, Dorothy. A long time. It was like a faint discord, a cloud passing over the sun when she called you Neil, wasn't it, Chris? It seemed so unnatural. It made you realize you were really Chris Daniels from New Haven, an English professor with a wife named Blanche. Yes, for a moment, Blanche is back in your mind. But it's only for a moment. She fades out again. And you're busy showing Dorothy Crystal Beach, the pink sand, making plans for the future. That evening, you are dancing at the Ace of the Club. It's a wonderful idea to come here, Neil. You like it, really? Ah, uh-huh. love it. Why didn't you tell me you danced like this? Well, I guess I didn't know I could. <laughs> Neil. Hmm? You know that man over there near the bar? Man? Mm-hmm. Which one? You no, know, the short and heavyset man. He seems to be looking at us. I don't know him. Neither do I. And he's probably not looking at us. He's looking at you, Dorothy. And I don't blame him. <laughs> you're talking mighty pretty, mister. Well, maybe that's because you're looking mighty pretty, miss. Oh, Neil. Hmm? Hold me tight. Well, Chris, there's no doubt in your mind about what's happening to you and Dorothy, is there? It's all very simple. You're certain she's in love with you, and you're in love with her. Yes, for the first time in your life, you're in love. But the clouds over the sun again. This time it won't go away. This whole thing is unfair to Dorothy, isn't it? And you're thinking about Blanche, that it's also unfair to her. Now you've got to make another decision. You're still thinking about it as you take Dorothy back to Belmont Manor, then return to your hotel. As you walk into the lobby, the desk clerk gives you something else to think about. Hey, Mr. Baldwin. Mr. Baldwin. Yes? What is it? Message for you, sir. Came while you were out. A message? Telephone call from New York. I took it myself. New York? Just from your wife, Mrs. Baldwin. Had to expect her sometime in the next few days. You hadn't counted on anything like this, had you, Chris? Neil had never mentioned his wife to you. You had no idea he was married. Neil Baldwin is dead. You're using his name. And Mrs. Baldwin will be arriving in a few days. You're trembling as you turn away from the desk clerk, start for the stairs, and then... Uh, Mr. Baldwin, one more thing. Yes? I almost forgot to tell you. There was a man here earlier in the evening asking about you. What do you want? Well, he didn't say. I thought you'd gone over to the Ace of Clubs, so I... What do he look like? Oh, what a blue suit, a rather short, heavy set man, as I remember. Yes, Chris, it's the short man again. The same man who was staring at you tonight when you were dancing with Dorothy at the Ace of Clubs. You're certain he's following you, aren't you? Perhaps he's from the police, and you wonder if he knows the truth about you. You hurry up to your room, and there's little sleep for you that night. The pressure is building, isn't it, Chris? First the message from Neil's wife, then the discovery that you're being followed. Yes, the pressure is mounting, and a strain on you begins to show the next evening at dinner. Neil... What's the matter? Matter? Well, nothing, Dorothy. Oh, yes, there is. All evening you've been acting so strangely. You look almost... What is it, darling? Dorothy, you'll have to trust me. Although you've no reason to, I must admit. I do trust you, Neil. I have a good reason to. Being in love with you is a good reason. Let's get out of here, Dorothy. All right. You know, there's that man again at the table near the wall. He seems to Don't be... look around, Dorothy. Just keep walking. What? Yes, Neil, of course. If you don't mind, I think I'd better take you back to your hotel. Neil. Neil, that man, is he what's bothering you? Uh, he's part of it. He's been following you, hasn't he? Are you in trouble, Neil? Yes, Dorothy. I'm in trouble. You take Dorothy back to the Belmont Manor and leave her with that hurt, puzzled look in her eyes. 
the look you'd give anything to smooth away. Then you go back to your hotel, and as you enter the lobby, the desk clerk calls to you. Oh, Mr. Baldwin. Yes? There was another telephone call for you an hour ago from New York, from Mrs. Baldwin. What did she say? That she was able to get plane reservations. She'll arrive tomorrow morning. You turn, run blindly out of the hotel into the night. But that's no answer, is it, Chris? You've got to make a decision, and you've got to do it soon. They're closing in on you. The short, heavy set man and Mrs. Baldwin. Yes, and there's Dorothy and Blanche, too. You walk for hours, thinking the whole thing out. And then finally you find yourself on the road leading to town and the Belmont Manor. Yes, the Belmont Manor and Dorothy. Because you've finally made your decision. You've decided to tell Dorothy everything. And you do. Your life with Blanche, your unhappiness, the madness that seized you when you discovered Neil was dead and that everyone thought it was you. How you've struggled with your conscience. And how your conscience finally won. Yes, you pour out the whole agonized story to Dorothy there on the beach. And the sun has come up before you finish. Chris, I like the name better than Neil, darling. It suits you more. I'm going back to Blanche, Dorothy. Yes, I know. She needs me. I should have known better than to think I could run out on my life. The running was nice while it lasted. Dorothy, I'll never forgive myself for what I've done to you. Oh, don't say that, Chris. Things just didn't work out, that's all. Why did I have to destroy the one thing I found? You didn't destroy me, Chris. I... When are you leaving? Right away, I guess. I don't know how I stand with the law. I'll find out when I get back, I suppose. I don't think I've done anything criminal. I've just been a fool, that's all. What about... Mrs. Baldwin? I don't know, Dorothy. When I get back to my room, I'll probably write her a letter telling her what's happened and leave Neil's money and papers with it for her. It's not exactly the brave thing to do, I suppose, but I, I just can't face her. Well, Chris, I, I guess you'd better be going. Yes. Dorothy, I can't ask you to forget or forgive. Too much has happened, but... I hope that time will help. Time will help, Chris. I hope it does. You see, this is probably all wrong, but I still love you. I'll go on loving you. Someday things might be different. Who knows? There's still an outside chance for us, Chris. So I'll be waiting. Oh, Dorothy. I love you, Dorothy. I always will. Goodbye, darling. It's all over now, isn't it, Chris? And there's nothing left to do but go back to your hotel, write the note to leave for Neil's wife, and then buy your ticket back to the United States, back to New Haven and Blanche. But it's not as easy as it sounds, is it? Writing the letter to Mrs. Baldwin is not easy. There's a lot of explaining to do. You're so engrossed in the letter that you don't hear the door behind you close softly. You don't see the short, heavy set man walk silently across the room and stand looking over your shoulder. Hello? What? What are you writing? A confession? Who are you? Jim Mason, private detective. What do you want? I think you know what I want. You and I are going to have a nice long talk, brother. Because right now, you're looking an awful lot of trouble right in the eye. The Whistler will return in just a moment with a strange ending to tonight's story. Meantime, a message especially for you drivers who have late model cars, or you lucky folks who will be getting new ones. Just any motor oil won't do, you know, for today's high-efficiency motors. No, sir. They need special protection against corrosion, wear, and carbon if you expect to get the long, trouble-free service that was built into them. That's why Signal Oil Company brought out Signal Premium Compounded Motor Oil, an improved type lubricant in which 100% pure paraffin base is fortified with scientific new compounds. 
Inside your motor, these compounds go to work, doing jobs that regular oil alone cannot do. One compound, for instance, actually washes out harmful carbon, gum, and varnish. Another compound in Signal Premium protects costly bearings against corrosion. And still other compounds do additional jobs of keeping wear down and performance up. That's why Signal Premium Compounded Motor Oil is your guarantee of a sweeter running motor. So for your next oil change, stop at a signal station. Get the improved type oil that does so much more than just lubricate. Signal Premium Compounded Motor Oil. And now back to the whistler. Well, Chris, they finally caught up with you. Your little adventure is at an end. Your first decision to use Neil's name, run away from home, was a bad one, wasn't it? And your second decision to go back. It looks like you made that one a little too late. Because now no one will ever believe you really were going back. There's only one thing to do, one thing you know how to do. And that's to tell Mason the whole story just as you told it to Dorothy. And that's what you do. You give Mason the whole story. Sort of a wild tale, ain't it? Oh, I know it must sound... You can, I can prove you're not Neil Baldwin? Well, yes. Yes, of course I can. Well, then you're a lucky guy. Lucky? Yeah, that dough he had. The 12000 he told you he'd saved up to retire on. Yeah? Well, he embezzled it from the company he worked for. What? They sent me down here after him. You still have the dough? Yes, it's over there in the briefcase. I haven't touched it. Good. Getting that dough back is all the company's interested in. And as far as I'm concerned, you can go on your way. Thanks. What are you going to do? Go back? Blanche needs me. It's the only decent thing I can do. You know, you're not quite out of the woods yet. I'm still not convinced you aren't Neil Baldwin. All right, Mrs. Baldwin. Come on in. Neil, darling, why didn't you meet me at the airport? I... Chris! Good Lord. Blanche! But I, I thought you... You were... I thought I was... What, Blanche? I, I thought you... You thought I died in that hotel fire instead of Neil. You thought he'd be here waiting for you with the money he stole. You had it all planned, didn't you? You knew he stole it, didn't you, Blanche? Yes, yes. And all the time I've been torturing myself, thinking about what I'd done to you. Chris, I... Oh, I... Oh, you know, I'm glad you came down here to meet Neil. It's kept me from making an awful mistake. Mistake? Yeah, that's right. An awful mistake. But it doesn't concern you anymore, Blanche. Just me. And someone who's waiting for me over at the Belmont Manor. <laughs> Let that whistle be your signal for the Signal Oil program, The Whistler, each Sunday night at this same time. Brought to you by the Signal Oil Company, marketers of Signal gasoline and motor oil and fine quality automotive accessories. Signal has asked me to remind you to get the most driving pleasure, drive at sensible speeds, be courteous, and obey traffic regulations. It may save a life, possibly your own. <laughs> Featured in tonight's story were John Beale, Betty Lou Gerson, and Mary Lansing. The Whistler was produced by George W. Allen and directed by Gordon T. Hughes with story by Bob Reif and music by Wilbur Hatch and was transmitted to our troops overseas by the Armed Forces Radio Service. At this same time next Sunday, another strange tale by The Whistler. Marvin Miller speaking. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. <laughs>